Tonight I shall receive the very best that God has for me. This Bible is God speaking to me. This Bible is God speaking to you. This Bible is God speaking to us. I love the Word of God. I receive the Word of God. I hear the Word of God. I do the Word of God. I thank God for 3,000 members in every service at Abundant Life. Amen. Y'all sound great. Go ahead. Be seated this evening. Turn, if you would, to the book of Genesis. It's the first one. Genesis, first book in the Bible, chapter 15 tonight. Genesis chapter 15. We're not going to be here long, but I promise I've got something good for you. Uh, I've been just thinking a, a lot about different things, and, and, and in my study, I've been studying just kind of the timing of God and, and how God tends to put things in order and, and put things in place, and how, you know, the timing of God, I don't know if you've noticed, but God's timing is always perfect for Him. Notice I said for Him. <laughs> like, it doesn't always seem perfect for us. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that in my life, that the timing of God I'm like, man, God, you could hurry up with some stuff and slow down with some other stuff. But it seems like for God, the timing is always right for him. Why? Because he knows best. He's seen the beginning. He's seen the end. He's not stuck in the middle. He's seen it all. And so God is organizing and positioning things in such a way as to work out the best for you, even if it doesn't look like it's going to work out the best for you. Have you ever noticed it seems like sometimes God waits till the last minute to get you what you're believing for? That it seems like it stretches until the last second before you need it that all of a sudden God shows up. But you know what? God knows exactly what he's doing. God is not forgetting about you. He's not missed you. He hasn't, you know, not heard your prayer God knows what he's doing. And so tonight we're going to talk about the timing of God for a little bit. And, uh, and I'm going to show you some things. And then we're going to hopefully get some answers to you for if you've got any questions on that. It's going to be good. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Watch, and it says, And the Lord said to him, this is now God is speaking to Abraham. Abraham is believing God for a child, and God is speaking. And the Lord says, Know for certain that for 400 years... Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and they will be mistreated there. But I will punish the nation that they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. And what did he say? Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs for how many years? What did he say? What did God say? 400 years. Now look in the book of Exodus chapter 12, if you want to turn there. Exodus chapter 12, that's the next book, Genesis, Exodus chapter 12. Now the length of time the Israelite people, this is verse 41. Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a difference. I'm not a genius, not a rocket scientist. I don't work at NASA, but my mind can wrap itself around two numbers. One of them is 400. One of them is 430. And I don't know about you, but those are different numbers in my book. And if God said they're going to come out in 400, but now it says in Exodus that it took them what? 430 years. To come out, I begin to wonder why. I said, God, it looked like it said 400. Where is that 30 year gap? Where, why were they in Egypt? Why were there slaves for 30 extra years? Now, if you want to find out the answer, go to X or to go to the book of Acts. So, this is now we're going all the way to the New Testament, Acts chapter 7. It says, Now Moses saw one of the Israelite slaves being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. And Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. What did God do? God raised up Moses to bring the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, right? Right? We all know that, that God was sending a deliverer. So at year 390, 
The Bible says Moses, who was raised in Pharaoh's house, he'd been uh, set aside by his mother, floated down the river, adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses, who had been in Pharaoh's house at year 390 of slavery, he's got one decade to live there and get him out in 400 years. But what happened? The Bible said Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. He rose up on the inside, killed the Egyptian, and in his mind, he was thinking, man, I know that I'm supposed to deliver the Israelites. So what if I kill this Egyptian and all the Israelites see that I'm going to be the deliverer and they're going to follow me and we're going to march out of Israel? But that's not what happened. What happened? At year 390, Moses kills the Egyptian and he thought that they would follow him, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? And you know what they said to him? They said, Man, are you going to kill us like you killed that dude yesterday? All of a sudden, they flipped on him, and they turned on him. He had a decade until they were supposed to be free. But what happened? The Bible says he ran to the desert, ran to the wilderness, and for 40 years... Moses stayed in the wilderness hiding from his destiny, waiting on God. But look, I got a great word for you because maybe today you feel like you're Moses. Maybe you've been hiding from your destiny. Maybe you feel like, man, God was supposed to do something for me 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 or even 40 years ago. But you've been running from it and you've been sitting on what the Bible says Moses was in the back side of the desert, but the Bible says God lit a bush on fire, and he said, man, you've been running, you've been hiding, but God said, I'm not through with you yet. That's a good word for somebody because maybe you thought God was done with you. Maybe you thought God was done with your children. Maybe you thought God was done with your spouse. But God says it's never too late for me to do something with your life. That's a good time to put your hands together if you were clapping. Because, you see, Moses was supposed to deliver the children of Israel at year 400. But because he jumped ahead of the timing of God, because he allowed his own zeal, was he doing something wrong by by helping a Hebrew slave? I don't think so. I think he was doing right. But the problem was, is Moses thought that the ends would justify the means. Peter thought that. The Bible says Jesus on his last night with his disciples was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was sweating blood and praying and crying to God. And it says that the Romans and the Hebrews came in and and they came to arrest Jesus. And Jesus said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. Bam, they fell on the ground. And it says when they got up and laid hands on Jesus, what did Peter do? He grabbed a sword and went to kill somebody. He thought... Man, if I force the hand of God, if I force Jesus to become what I want him to be, then Jesus will rise up and will start the insurrection now and we'll all be free of the Romans. The ends justify the means. That's what Peter was thinking. That's what Moses was thinking. And you know what happened with Peter? I don't know if you know the story. He swung to cut a guy's head off. But luckily, Peter was a bad swordsman, and the dude was real quick because the Bible says the guy dodges it like in the Matrix. He dodges the sword, and instead of cutting his head off, all Peter does is cut off his ear, which I think you give Peter 100 more swings, he couldn't cut that dude's ear off if he wanted to. But it says he cuts the ear off. Now you got this dude grabbing his head, crying that his ear's been cut off. And what does Jesus do? Instead of Jesus rising up and starting a fight, he walks over to the ear, picks it up. Because watch, do you think that the Romans were going to let Peter get away with that? They were going to arrest him and kill him for attempted murder. But what did Jesus do? He grabbed the ear put it back on the dude's head, and he says, man, he said, what are you talking about? Nobody swung a sword. He's like, where's the evidence that a sword was swung? And they were like, well, the dude's ears cut off, and Jesus is like, it looks like a perfectly good ear to me. 
Look, man, he covered it up. He said it never even happened. What are you talking about? And watch, Peter tried to what? Force the hand of God. His heart was right. Moses' heart was right, but his timing was wrong. You see, in your life, with the plan of God working in your world, your heart can be right, but your timing can be wrong. People so often, instead of waiting on the timing of God, they get the timing of God and they think, man, I can get ahead of what God is trying to do because what God is taking too long. So what happens? You've been believing for a husband. You've been believing for a wife. And instead of waiting on the perfect one, you jump ahead. Oh, man, I'm meddling right there. You get ahead and you think, well, I'm going to do it myself instead of waiting on God to do what God was going to do anyway. And so you go through two divorces until you find the right one that was there the whole time. That if you just would have waited on the timing of God. You see, God gives vision, but with vision there always comes preparation. We want the vision of God, and then we want it right now. We want it to happen yesterday. But the problem is God doesn't work like that. God gives you vision, what, for the future. God says you've got to look forward. But right after you're looking forward, what do you have to do? You've got to start looking down. You've got to start focusing on the day-to-day -day preparation to get where God wants you to go. I'm seeing that firsthand with my little boys that are walking. They've been walking for a few months, and they still hadn't quite figured out that they've got the vision for, for long distance. They can, they can look forward and walk, and they're like, let's go. The problem is, is they can have tons of stuff on the ground in front of them, but they're not paying attention to what's on the ground. They're paying attention to, I am here, and I want to go there. And so they start walking, and, and they know because they just laid the toy down in front of them, and now they're stepping all over it and falling down and crying, and i got to go and pick them up, because instead of looking where they were walking, they were looking where they wanted to go. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking where you want to go, but as long as you're looking where you want to go, you've also got to watch where you're stepping. You see, we understand that because we've been doing it forever. We've been walking forever, so it's no big deal to us. But the problem is, is they're babies and they got to learn. Well, so many of us in Christianity and in vision and in the plan of God, we're still babies. We still have to learn that I can have the long-term vision of God, but I've got to have the short-term preparation for that vision. That it's not just, oh, God's going to do it today. You say, well, God did it today for, for the Bible people, but he really didn't. Abraham had to wait 27 years from promise to when he finally got the answer. 27 years he waited. Joseph, from the time he had the dream that he was going to lift up above all the other people, it was 22 years between when Joseph knew it was going to happen, the vision, and when it actually happened. David, from the time he was anointed king until he was king, was over 13 years and from then it was another seven years before he got all of the kingdoms. It was 20 years David had to wait. Paul had to wait 14 years from the time he converted to the time he began his, his ministry in a full way, 14 years. Jesus, from the time he showed up on the scene at 12, had to wait 18 years to start preaching, and another three years until he died and rose from the grave. So if you think that God's going to give you McDonald's time and have it ready right now, I mean, you, you, you're not following a biblical model here. Now, I know that's not fun to hear, and it's definitely not fun to say, but that's reality, is that when God gives you vision, now you start the preparation. If Moses could have just waited... He would have been the shortest of every hero in the Bible. His time would have only been 10 years, one decade. And the thing about it is, is Moses, watch this, this blows my mind. He spent 40 years miserable in the desert, and he could have spent 10 years living as a king in the palace. But because he jumped ahead of the timing of God, it cost him an extra 30 years in the desert when he could have just spent a decade in the, in the palace. Now, I don't know about you, but if I've got the choice 
between 40 years in the wilderness or 10 years living like a king, I'm going to choose the 10. I'm going to choose the 10 years being happy than the 40 years being miserable. You see, it wasn't God's will for Moses to go to the desert. It wasn't God's will for that bush to have to be lit up. It was God's will that Moses at year 400 would lead the Israelites out. But the great thing is, is watch, you can't rush the timing of God. You can't speed the timing up. You can delay it, but you can't speed it up. So often we want to speed it up, but that doesn't happen. What happens is, is we can delay it. But the great news about it all is, watch, maybe you've delayed the timing of God. Maybe you feel like you missed the timing of God. Maybe you feel like you're, you're past anything that God could do with you. But God in your life can still light a bush on fire, and he can still call you out because God's not through with you yet. He's not done with you. He still has a mission for you. It's Valentine's Day, and everybody's focused on loving each other and all that, you know. Somebody a while back asked me, they said, Josh, they said, you know, man, I, they, were, they were having some struggle in their marriage, and they said, man, what do we do? Because they said, you know, I feel like, you know, that, that I was supposed to marry this one person, and, and so I married them, and then it didn't work out. And they said, I feel like, man, that was my one from God, and now I missed it, and and they said, you know, I just, I really believe that God only has one person for every person. They said, what do you think about that? I said, well, I don't believe in that at all. They said, you don't think that there's one person for every one person? I said, not a chance I believe that. They said, how can you not believe that? I said, well, because you got to think about it. I said, has anybody ever been divorced in the history of the world? They said, yeah. I said, well, if that one person got divorced, if they missed it with their one person, well, then they blew it for all of us. Because if they didn't get their one person and they let that one person go, then their one person got with somebody else. And so they missed their one person. And then everybody is a chain reaction. Everybody's missed their one person. I said, do I think that God only has one person? I said, I think that God makes whoever you're with that's your one person. I said, man, it's not about you got to find that one person. I said, it's whoever you've got, you got to make them that one person. Because if you just expect them to be perfect, you're going to be expecting the wrong thing. And you're going to be in a lot of trouble and a lot of hurt. Because, look, marriage, I think we can all agree if you're married in this place, marriage is work. Now, it's easy work when you're in love. But it's still work. You got to compromise and you've got to be in love. It's not natural to always get along. You got to compromise to get along. Because it's easy for, for wedges to be drawn. It's easy for the enemy to come in and try and split you up over stupid stuff. But I thank God that we have the ability to continually fall in love. I told Catherine, I said, man, I fell in love with you more and more every single day. I said, because I choose to love you more and more every day. It's a choice. It's not just, oh, man, I'm stuck with you. That's not how it works. I mean, she's probably thinking that about me. She's like, my God, I'm stuck with him. But, but it's not the way. You see, I believe that it's, it's, you know, the will of God. I've talked about this before, but the will of God, so many times people think the will of God is like a set of train tracks, and you're on this chug, 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 you know, and, and you're on train tracks, and if you miss it, you derail your train, and then it's over. You missed your chance with God, but I don't believe that at all. I think, I think that the will of God is like an airplane. That airplane, it's up in the air, and it may take you a little bit longer to get there. You may have to circle a little bit. You may have to avoid some, some clouds, or you may have to avoid some rain, or you may have to go up or down. But the reality is, is as long as that airplane is still in the air, you have a chance to get to your destination. Well, a train track, man, you got that train, it can derail where you blew it. But that's not what the will of God is like. The will of God says as long as you've got breath in your lungs, God can still use you. God still has a plan for you. God still has a purpose for your life as long as you can still move. You see, just because you didn't get your answer didn't mean God didn't hear you. Just because you haven't got your answer yet doesn't mean God doesn't hear you. God's in action does not mean that he's lazy. It doesn't mean that he forgot about you. It doesn't mean that he's ignoring you. It might just mean that it's not time yet. It's not time yet. But the problem is so often is when God doesn't do what we want, I don't know about you, I'm this way, I start to ask louder and more often. 
When I don't get what I want from God, I start to ask more often. I'm like, I start to get louder and, and more, you know, upset a little bit and, and more animated with my request. Even though I know God heard me the first time, I still ask and ask and ask. And finally, I'm like shouting at God. And I'm like, man, do you not hear me? Like, what's the problem? I, uh, I flew over Last week, I flew over to England, uh, to London. My sister lives just south of there, uh, and she just had, believe it or not, she just had twin babies. I don't know any other brother and sister had twins like that. That's crazy. We had two boys. She had a boy and a girl. And so I flew over there and surprised her. She had no idea I was coming. I just flew over, showed up at her house, and just held babies for a week, and it was awesome, and I had a great time. But uh, So I was coming back home, and I'm sitting at the airport. I'd gone early. And so I'm in London Heathrow Airport, huge airport, and, and I'm sitting there eating breakfast at like 7.30 in the morning, and I'm, and I'm sitting eating breakfast at this table, and a lady comes up to talk to the hostess, and I'm sitting right by the hostess saying, so I'm, and I don't have anybody else with me, so I'm just like listening to everybody's conversations, you know, and, uh, and so this lady comes up, and she's Indian, she's from India, and, and she's talking to a hostess who is from France, but they're both speaking English. So neither one of them sounds like English is their first language, but they're both speaking English. And the woman that's there is asking the hostess if they have French fries. And the hostess is like, yeah, we got French fries. And the lady's like, yeah, but no, I, I want to know if you have French fries. And she's like, I just answered that question, yes, we have French fries. And she's like, well, how much are they? And so she told her, and she says, no, I want to know how much the French fries are. And she told her the answer again. And she says, well, are you, so they're, they're French fries and they're this much. And she said, yes. And so the lady, I, I, I don't know what was going on because I'm sitting there like just enthralled in this conversation. She asked her again, now, do you have French fries? I was like, I almost got out of my chair and was like, she just said they have French fries and they're this much. Like if you got a problem with the French fries or the price, I'll pay for your French fries so I don't have to hear you. Look, the lady was like shouting. Everybody in the restaurant is looking because she's like, do you have French fries? The lady's like, oh, my God, yes, we have French fries. It was the most insane thing. I wish I would have recorded it, but I didn't have the forethought to think about it. But I was like, I couldn't believe it. She just couldn't figure out. And so she finally got in her head, yes, they have French fries, and they were like, they were cheap. They were like 78 cents or something. They weren't even expensive. And she was like, she was like, so you have them? They're this much? And he's like, yeah. And she says, well, that's okay. I'm going to go somewhere else. I was like, all of this, I swear to you, it was like a three-minute conversation over 78 cent French fries, and she decided she didn't even want them. I was like, ma'am, there is a McDonald's down the way that I promise has good French fries. I want to just tell her, go get French fries. But the problem was is they were both kind of speaking other languages a little bit, and neither one of them was speaking totally clear, but the problem was is she was asking a question and apparently not getting the answer she wanted, so what did she do? She asked it again and got louder and louder and louder, and so many times that's what we end up doing because we see God not acting and we expect God's not acting because either he doesn't care, he's lazy, or he doesn't hear us. And so we ask louder and louder and louder. But you've got to recognize something with God. God knows what you don't. He hears what you can't, and he sees what you won't. God knows things about you that you don't know, and he hears things that you can't hear, and he sees things that you'll never be able to see. You've got to learn to trust in God. You've got to learn to trust that God's plan is better than your plan. God's knowledge is higher than your knowledge. You've got to learn, watch this, you've got to learn how to listen and not to speak. When I get to a place where my prayers aren't getting answered, and I've prayed, and I've prayed, and I've prayed. What I end up doing, instead of shouting louder at God because he's not answering me, I shut up and listen. Because so many times when I start to listen to what God has to say, either my prayers begin to change, or I hear the answer that I was expecting. But if you're always shouting at God, telling him to answer your prayer the way you want it, you can't listen and shout at the same time. And so the Bible says that God did three things with Moses. Moses came to God. It was 40 years after he should have gotten this answer. Or actually, 30 years after he should have finished. But God, number one, he revealed his presence to Moses. 
He reveals his presence. God's going to do this to Moses, and he does it to you. He reveals his presence. When you begin to listen to God, he'll reveal his presence. Number two, he'll remind you of his promise. God reveals himself to you first. He reminds you of what he has promised you second. And number three, he resurrects the purpose on the inside of you. He resurrects the purpose. And when God does this for Moses, Moses asked God, he said, God, he said, man, I, I see all this. I hear all this. I know that I'm supposed to be a deliverer. He says, but who am I, God? Because when God reveals his purpose to you, what it does is it begins to stretch you. It begins to stretch who you are. And when you start to stretch, watch this, you begin to get scared. Because you're not able to do what God has called you to do by yourself. And so you get worried because you say, how will I ever be able to do this? But the great news is, is you're not going to have to do it alone. If God called you and God anointed you and God did it for you, God is going to be with you. So you've got to begin to agree with what God says about you. If God says you're healed, agree with him. If God says you're saved, agree with him. If God says you're sanctified, agree with him. If God says you're blessed, agree with him. If God says you're forgiven, agree with him. you got to agree with what God says because so many times what we do is we have a conversation with God and an argument with God, but the problem is, is when God speaks and we speak, if God says you're blessed but you tell God you're not, then you're having a conversation in two different languages. Because when God says you're blessed, that's faith. When you say you're not, that's fear. And faith and fear are not the same language. It may sound like English to you, but to God, it's a foreign language. God says, I don't understand fear. I don't listen to fear. Fear and me don't get along. God speaks faith. So if God called you healed, go ahead and be healed. Go ahead and agree with what God has told you. If God calls you sanctified, go ahead and agree. Because that's two different languages that are competing for attention. And what it'll do is it'll talk you out of God's best. You see, but people will think you're crazy sometimes. I was in my car today, headed to the gym to work out. And on my way to the gym, a Bruno Mars song came on the radio. Now, like, I don't know if y'all ever listened to Bruno Mars before. And again, I'm not, I don't think anything. I just was listening to the radio, flipping through channels. A song came on. And, and I just, in my car, I started dancing to this song. Now, I don't know if you know anything about me, but I, I don't dance, right? Like, I'm a fairly reserved person. You wouldn't think it, but I'm pretty reserved. And so I'm just, like, grooving in my car. And I don't even know, I'm sitting at a stoplight just dancing in my car to myself, listening to music. It's cranked up real loud. And I look over, and there's somebody in the car next to me, two people sitting there, and they are laughing. And they're not just laughing at me. One of them's got his phone out recording me. And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't even. And my windows on my car aren't tinted, so I know they can see me. And I know they probably are like, look at this idiot in his car without any rhythm, dancing to God knows what. But look, the thing was, normally I would care about this, right? Like normally I'd be embarrassed. But at the end of the day, I wasn't even embarrassed. I didn't even care. Because if they would have been listening to what I was listening to, they would have been dancing too. Now watch, I've said that to say this. You've got people in your life who think you're crazy, who think what you're doing is crazy. But the thing about it is, is they don't listen to what you listen to. They haven't heard the voice that's been speaking to you. If they had been listening to what you've been listening to, they wouldn't think you're crazy. They wouldn't laugh at you. They'd get excited with you because they would have heard what you've heard. When God speaks to you, you got to stop caring what everybody else thinks. Stop caring what everybody else says because what they say doesn't matter because they haven't heard what you've heard. They hadn't been where you've been. They haven't done what you've done. You can't care about what people think. Why? Because you've got confidence in God. You've got confidence in his plan in your life. You've got confidence in the timing of God in your life. And when you have confidence in those things, it's impossible to lose. Moses looked at God and he said, God, he said, what do I tell him? He said, man, I know now you've just told me who I am, but what do I tell him that you are? And God said, you tell him I am. He said, that's my name. My name is I am. And a lot, I preached this a couple weeks ago. And I talked about, look, everything you're not, God says I am, right? 
Everything you're not. So when you say, I'm not strong enough, God says, I am. But watch, it even goes farther than that. Because when, when it's not just everything you're not, watch, it's everything you need. When you say, I'm thirsty, I need water, God says, I am water. When you say, man, I'm sick, I need healing, God says, I am healing. It's not just what you're not, it's everything you need, physical, mental, spiritual. You see, everything that you need in life, God says, I am what you need. I am your supply. I am your healing. I am your deliverance. I am your power. Everything you need God says, I am. You need protection, God is your protection. You need strength, God is your strength. You need, you need prosperity, God is your blessing. Everything you need, God is. Not God was and not God will be, God is. And you see, when you put your trust in that, when you put not just your trust, but when you put your confidence your full confidence in who God is, then you can't lose. You can't be beat. Why? Because God is everything you would ever need. When you put your trust in the plan of God and the timing of God, knowing that God will do what God will do when God is ready to do it. And the thing about it is it'll never be too early. And it'll never be too late. God is always right on time. God knows exactly what to do and when to do it. He is always right on time. And what happens is, is when you put your confidence in the timing of God, then you will always have exactly what you need. And you see, there's something so spiritual, something so supernatural about trusting God. You see, it's easy for us to trust God in our, in our salvation. You say, man, God, I can trust you in my salvation. That's easy. I can believe that I gave or that you gave your life for me and I accepted you and now I'm saved. That's easy. But where people get weird is people forget that it's easier in my mind to think that God can heal me than to think that he can make all my sins disappear. I feel like that's easier to think about. I'm like, man, I've done some messed up stuff, but God forgave all that. Man, if God can do that, imagine what he can do with my health. If God can forgive my sin, imagine what he can do in my family. If God can forgive my sin, imagine what he can do with my money. Man, it's amazing what God can do when you put your confidence in him. You see, I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know if maybe you're like Moses and you're exactly where you needed to be before he attacked the Egyptian. He was where he was supposed to be. And then he kind of got away from the plan of God. But the great news is the plan of God always gets you right back on time. Always gets you right back where you're supposed to be. It may take a minute, but you'll get there. Why? Because the will of God is not a set of train tracks. It's an airplane. And as long as you're still alive, God knows how to get you where you need to be. And I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe tonight you got everything under order and maybe you're all set. Or maybe tonight you feel like you've missed it somewhere. You feel like years ago, days ago, minutes ago, you feel like, man, I missed what I was supposed to do. I missed where I was supposed to go. I missed who I was supposed to be. And you say, I need to get my life right back on track. And there's a thousand ways to do that. But I believe tonight that you can make one step. I believe that God can do it tonight and that you can get that plan back where you're supposed to be. And I'm going to ask tonight, uh, th uh, there's a thousand ways to do it, and, and I, I just feel like tonight, I feel like this is the right way to go. I'm going to ask you tonight, man, I, I, I believe, I believe in the power of God. I believe in the presence of God, and I believe the presence of God is here, and I believe that something supernatural can happen tonight. But it takes an act on your part. There's a thousand ways to do it, and I've done it a million different things. But I believe tonight, watch this. There is something so unique. The Bible says when God spoke to Abraham, and God laid out the plan for his life, that Abraham sacrificed. When God spoke to David, David sacrificed. When God spoke to Samuel, Samuel sacrificed. When God spoke to Saul, Saul sacrificed. Why? Have you noticed that there is a pattern? When God spoke to Noah, Noah sacrificed. When God spoke to Moses, Moses sacrificed. They give of something of their self. Moses laying aside his shoes was more than just taking his shoes off. That was a sign of God, I'm giving everything I am to you. 
And look, we do that when we give our life to God. We give our salvation to God. We say, God, I'm giving you my life. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.